All right, I'll start again. Welcome everyone today's, uh, to today's uh, study session for the Board of Adjustment. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, start with uh, the upcoming case. Uh, this is for next month's um, scheduled Board of Adjustment public hearing. Uh, this is a residential project at 5902 East Ryan Place. Uh, the applicant is proposing to construct a new detached carport as well as relocate an existing shed um, on his property. Um, the applicant is proposing uh, several variances, which include uh, exceeding the 12 foot height limitation for an accessory structure and is proposing to reduce the side streets and rear perimeter yard setbacks. Um, please be aware that this case will be conducted entirely on Zoom. Um, I believe mayor and council chambers are already in, uh, booked at that time. So we will have to uh, do this entirely on Zoom rather than in a hybrid format. And I will be sending a quorum check as well, if unless anyone knows whether they'll be there or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll send a follow-up email. Sure. Okay, uh, now that we've covered uh, the uh, upcoming case for next month, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, discussing the first case today. Sonia, can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so today's first case that uh, will be discussed is a C102403 cap storage indoor storage facility Cab Storage Wilmot LLC. Address is 324 South Wilmot Road. Uh, and the proposed zoning is C2 Commercial. Um, the applicant in this instance is uh, proposing to construct a new personal storage building um, on this site. Um, the original zoning classifications for the property are P for parking, as well as C1 commercial. And again, the applicant has undergone uh, the rezoning process to rezone the parcel to C2 commercial. Um, that rezoning was authorized by mayor and council in 2022. Uh, with this project, um, again, the applicant is proposing a three-story personal storage or self-storage building um, within a storage uh, use development uh, within the Unified Development Code. The minimum required um, access lane or parking area access lane uh, for two-way is 30 feet. Uh, the applicant is requesting a variance uh, to reduce that parking area access lane width from 30 feet to 24 feet. Sonia, can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. So again, uh, there's that language. Um, the reasoning uh, why the applicant is uh, requesting this variance, um, the applicant originally provided a, a preliminary development plan uh, showing uh, access or vehicular access all around the entire site. Um, that uh, access was all one way and within the Unified Development Code, the minimum width of a one way access lane is 24 feet. And so um, at the time, the project was meeting that uh, minimum width requirement. However, during the rezoning process, uh, there were a few uh, rezoning conditions that applied to the proposal. Uh, one of them is a expansive uh, stormwater basin on the western side of the uh, site. Uh, additionally, there's a 25 foot wide um, public trail easement um, that would have um, uh, affected um, kind of the location of the building as well as vehicular circulation on the site. So with that, um, the, the applicant had to revise their preliminary development plan um, and provide uh, instead two-way parking area access lanes that tie into the east and west uh, parcels. 
Um, zoning administration has no objection to the proposed variance, and to date we have received one written approval or support, as well as one written uh, protest. Uh, and I think now is the time to open it up to discussion if the board has questions. Yeah, I, I just want to understand a little better behind the requirement. Sure, Mr. Marks. Um, I uh, don't necessarily want to conjecture the reasoning why it's uh, 30 feet uh, pal width requirement within um, storage uses. Um, however, um, this 30 foot minimum width uh, applies to all storage uses, not necessarily just personal storage. So um, unfortunately, I, I don't necessarily have the answer as to the reasoning behind that excessive width. Mr. Marks, you are correct. That's all right. Yeah, I, I had exactly that same question because I've dealt with PALs before. And they've always been 24 feet. So that would have been my question is why all of a sudden have they become 30 feet? Um, I think in the materials that we were given, there was an explanation for that in that in the past, the storage units were normally single story and people would load and unload outside in lane and they needed extra width so that there could still be vehicular traffic movement if somebody was parked loading and unloading. So that was the explanation we were given in the materials. Correct. Yes, that is... Uh commonly affiliated with storage use developments. In this uh, specific instance, it's all entirely within one enclosed three-story building where you have uh, basically the uh, vehicle that comes uh, through the ground floor and unloads within a 30-foot wide kind of loading area. If I may add to that, um, that certainly can be an explanation and a rationale that the applicant provided, but the unified development code does not provide us any rationale as to why the 30 foot exists. We can only conjecture because there is no explanation in the code. It just says there's a 30 foot requirement for all storage use developments, which includes, you know, mini warehouses and anything else that falls into that category. I think it's logical to assume that that requirement is because bigger trucks or unloading is a common thing that would happen in a storage use type development. And that's a logical assumption. Um, but again, the code does not provide us that, you know, kind of rationale or dialogue regarding that. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could just add, uh, Mr. Marks, can you please turn your mic on when you're speaking? Let's go to a testing. There you go. I know now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I I have a question. Um, the provided plan that they gave us, the civil engineer, a civil engineer from South Carolina. And um, uh, noting that I had a lot of trouble finding the uh, listed address on Tucson Maps and on Google Maps because it just dropped me a circle in the middle of the intersection of uh, Wilmot and 14th Street. And uh, so I finally found it on Pima Maps and uh, the address is given and the parcel number is given by the civil engineer on there are all uh, are on this 322, not 324, and two parcels of the same number, but an A and B, whereas the parcel listed on the uh, uh, website, on Assessor's website, is has the designator C on it. And so there are a lot of things going on with that that 
thought maybe they just never bothered to show up here or whatever. And uh, also there's, uh, well, I had to turn on the um, photo uh, display of the site to note that the road to the north is the access, which it doesn't show on when you don't turn on the, any of that roadway doesn't show anywhere because it's just where the mall decide to put it. And uh, uh, the plan shows uh, access all the way around the site and plus two accesses out the west property line. But there were no specific property lines shown on the, the plan that I could detect. And uh, so there's two accesses out there and you look at the aerial, of course, and there's no roads or any development on the west side of that piece of property. And um, I'm curious about, you know, how that thing, how it actually meets up with the, I see the, uh, the designated right away for the path and the, uh, the exits to the north, um, but where's, where's, the, where's, the, where's these hypothetical roadways to the west and what's going on with this thing? It just was not real clear. Plus there was no real, um, usually when you get a site plan from a lot of people, they'll give you a, a little thing up in the corner saying this site here, uh, and there's no such thing on that piece of drawing. So I am curious about where's all this development going uh, that's not shown on the site and how it meets with the roadway. And it's just a lot of very confusing things on that site plan. I mean, I don't think I have much objection to 24 foot pals, but I'm curious, it's just drove me a little bit. So need Mr. Chair and members of the board, uh, you are correct that the uh, true address of the property is 324 South Wilmot Road. Um, on map Tucson, it does show the correct uh, parcel ID. It doesn't show the address being located um, within uh, the middle of the intersection. Um, I believe um, the confusion also stems under the fact that when you look up the development package case number, the development on the property research online uh, website, for whatever reason, it's affiliated with 322. Uh, the correct uh, parcel number for this site ends in the letter C as in Charles. Anything about the development that is hypothetically going on to the west side of that piece of property? That's just nothing but bare dirt out there and a parking lot not far from it. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I think this may be more appropriate for the applicant to respond to. If I could add, it, it, relevant to that <clears throat> line of questioning, I think it's relevant that the owner of that parcel to the west has indicated approval, if I've read and recall the, the material correctly. So uh, the access provided to the parcel to the west presumably is to the satisfaction of the owner. Mr. Marks and members of the board, uh, the uh, written letter of support that we received is from the property owner to the east and not the, the west. East. I stand corrected. Hmm. If there's no more discussion, then I think we can move on to uh, the next case, Sonia. <clears throat> okay, this is C102206. Berman Residence Garage Conversion um, at 2406 East Hawthorne. Um, this property is um, approximately 0.3 acres, um, zoned R1, which is residential zoning classification, and is developed with a single residence. Could you speak East. directly into your mic, please? I can hardly hear you. Better? Okay. Okay, the property is located on the southeast corner of Hawthorne Street and Norton Avenue. The applicant is proposing to convert the existing detached garage to an accessory dwelling unit. I think we can go to the next slide. 
the applicants requesting um, the following variances to allow the conversion of a detached garage to ADU with a reduced rear perimeter yard setback from 9.4 to zero as measured to the south lot line and to allow the conversion of a detached garage to an ADU with a height of 14 feet, which exceeds the maximum height of 12 feet of an ADU. The subject property is located in the Sam Hughes neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> it consists of large lots developed with single family homes that have attached and detached carports and or garages. <clears throat> um, there have been two approvals received and no protests and I can answer any questions. And Mr. Chair, if I can uh, jump in before any questions come up. Um, regarding this case, uh, city staff recognized during the variance submittal that there was a missed comment during the review of the original permit submittal. And uh, essentially what took place was the conversion of the ADU would eliminate the parking required for the SFR on the site. We've since contacted the applicant and they are agreeable to adding two parking spaces at the front of the property off of Hawthorne Street. So that will be addressed on a future submittal, um, but did wanna bring that to your attention. It was depicted on a, on a site plan that they submitted on the previous slide here. Um, so if you care to see that, we could go back to that slide, but I did wanna mention that. And should you um, find the variance uh, acceptable and, and intend to approve it, you could condition your approval on the required parking being provided off of Hawthorne. Good, I have no questions. Anybody else have any? We don't have any questions. I do wanna add one more item on the second request on this variance, which is for the height. Um, the applicant has indicated that they would like an increased height from 12 feet to 14 feet. Um, they've stated that's based on the design of the conversion um, needed for building code. Um, we as zoning staff don't have a necessarily in-depth knowledge of that. so. Um, I would recommend that the board, if you're going to um, recommend approval of that variance request, that you need to have a finding as to why that height um, allowance is necessary and warranted for this um, variance. So if I can uh, ask for a little clarification of that, are, are you suggesting that that any approval of a of the height variance be subject to a condition that there be demonstration that building codes requires something of that nature. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, um, uh, Royal City Attorney's Office, just to clarify, I think what. Uh, uh, Ms. Hamlin is referring to is that in order for the board to find that the uh, variance for that second request is appropriate, there needs to be some justification, some finding uh, that there's a reason for that height increase uh, as opposed to um, just sort of a vague reference to a building code, if that makes sense. So, so that would have to be rolled into a condition of approval. Is that correct? No, you're already required to make those fine. I, I'm suggesting that evidentially, uh, you'll need to find some evidence in the record justifying your your granting of your granting of that variance. So, if we're satisfied that there is a reason for that variance, then we can approve it without a condition. Right. We're not asking for an additional condition. We're just asking for an appropriate record. Mm -hmm. Ms. Willis, please. Um, so is it acceptable for our body to approve one of the variances and not the other? It is appropriate, yes. And you okay. may modify the-, the Because the I did have a question about the justification that was given in the staff report about needing the extra two feet to accommodate the functionality of the space. And my question of the applicant is going to be, what does that mean? And that's an appropriate question, okay. yes. 
Thank you. If there's no more discussion on C-102405, I think we can conclude the study session. Uh, we can take a break until uh, 1.30, which is in seven minutes. Thank you.
It is 1.30 p.m., so I think we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the public hearing now. Mr. Marks, it's 1.30. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started with the public hearing now. Um, Mr. Chair, if you'd like to do the call of order, please. I'd like to uh, call to order this meeting of the uh, Tucson uh, Board of Adjustments. Uh, and uh, uh, Ms. Hamblin, could we have a roll call, please? Uh, Bruce Dawson. Here. Miranda Schubert. Here. Irma Duran. Here. Bonnie Paulus. Present. Michael Marks. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Very good, thank you. Um, welcome to this uh, meeting of the City of Tucson Board of Adjustments for uh, August 28th, 2024. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. By joining, you are giving your consent for this meeting to be recorded. An introduction of each case will be made by staff. At the conclusion of staff's presentation, the applicant or the applicant's representative will be able to have the opportunity to speak. For the record, please tell the board your name and address and state your request. At the conclusion of the applicant's presentation, other persons wishing to speak in favor of the request may come forward and state their support. When called by the chair of the board, those wishing to speak in opposition to the applicant's request may come forward and state their protest. The chair may allow the applicant the opportunity for a brief rebuttal. The chair will then close the public hearing, excuse me, and open up a discussion by the board members. At the conclusion of the board's discussion, a motion will be made and if seconded, will be voted upon. All presentations today must be directed solely towards the board uh, and not to staff or members of the audience. All presentations to the board must be made well, also only on the items brought before the board. Presentation of matters unrelated real request will not be heard. The discussion of the board of adjustments may be a, a decision, pardon me, of the board of adjustments may be a appeal to the Superior Court of Pima County by failing, filing a complaint or a special action with the Pima County Superior Clerk's Office uh, within 30 days of the board's de decision. For additional information on this filing process, please contact Superior Court Clerk's Office or an attorney after today's public hearing. If you are going to give testimony today, please be brief and to the point, repetition of testimony already given or by other witnesses is not necessary. The chair may invoke a time limit if deemed necessary. Before you testify, please remember to sign in on the roster sheet on the clipboard at the podium. If you are joining us remotely, please state your name and address for the record. All testimony to the board may be given under must be, must be given under oath. If you are going to speak or think you may speak today, please stand at this time and raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, a reminder, please turn off uh, all cell phones off and or on silent mode. If you are joining us remotely, please be sure to mute yourself and turn your camera off unless you are addressing the board. Mr. Castro, please call our first case, but Mr. Castro is not here, is he? No, he's not. Um, thank you. And uh, as a reminder for anyone in person who will uh, be uh, speaking, uh, there is a sign up sheet or a sign in sheet rather uh, at the podium. 
Mr. Chair, members of the board, today's first case is C-102403, CAP Storage Indoor Storage Facility, CAP Storage Wilmot LLC, 324 South Wilmot Road, proposed C-2 zoning. The applicant's property is an approximately 2.4 acre vacant site zoned C-1 commercial and P parking. The applicant has been authorized to rezone the property to C2 commercial and proposes to construct a new personal storage building. The applicant's request to the board. The applicant is requesting the following variants. One, reduce the width of the two-way parking area access lanes within the storage development from 30 feet to 24 feet, all as shown on the submitted plans. Related plan reviews. Case C92207, CAP Storage Facility, Wilmot, is a rezoning request from C1 Commercial and P Parking to C2 Commercial to construct a new personal storage building. The P zone does not allow commercial development and the C1 zone allows a maximum building height of only 16 feet for a personal storage use. On December 6, 2022, the mayor and council authorized the rezoning. Planning and Development Services recommendation. PDSD staff has no objection to the applicant's requested variance. It is the opinion of staff that there are special circumstances applicable to the property, that the granting of the variance will not constitute a granting of special privileges inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and zone in which such property is located, and that the variance requested is the minimum needed to afford relief and is the least modification pos uh, possible of those UDC provisions which are in question. To date, we have received a total of one written approval and one written protest. For the record, board members have been provided a copy of the approval and protest received. Mr. Chair, members of the board, this concludes staff's presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I, I do have one question I failed to ask during the study session, and that is um, this request, if approved, would only apply to the streets where the PALs shown on the site plan that are noted as 24 feet it would not apply to the one PAL that's noted as 30 feet. So that 30 foot PAL would remain as, at 30 feet. Is that not correct? Mr. Marks and members of the board, I believe that is correct. The PALs that are shown as 24 feet wide are the PALs that are proposed- The only ones. Through the variance process, okay. correct. Very good. Just had one question. What's the building height maximum in C2? Ms. Paulus and members of the board, the maximum building height in the C2 zone is 40 feet. If there are no more questions, I would offer the, uh, or anyone wishing to speak in favor of the, uh, the project to come forward. The applicant. That's the applicant. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Uh, Who I would. Yeah. Okay. That's you. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, my name is Rory Juneman, 5983 East Grant Road in Rory. the city. Uh, we're the. I don't think your mic's on. I have a little one. I've got a green light. Oh, there you Are go. we good? All right. All right. I'll start over. Sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, my name is Rory Juneman, 5983 East Grant Road in the city. We represent um, Centennial American Properties, refer to them as CAP, uh, who is the developer of this, pro this property. They're, they've also got five others uh, in the city that are in various stages of development. So we've worked with them uh, quite a bit. Brody Glenn is from CAP. Um, he may speak to you if, if you have any questions about the project. And then Robin Large is also with me from Lazarus and Sylvan. So um, got about a 10 or 15 minute presentation. Uh, I'll 
some of the things that staff mentioned in the, in the study session are a little redundant, but I want to explain a few things, uh, especially some questions that you all have. I think we've got some answers too. So next slide, please. So I want to start off with just an overview of the property. Um, so you see in the, the solid yellow square is our project. Um, and then to the east of that are the two other parcels that are um, essentially the owner of those two parcels sold cap this property that we're developing the personal storage on. Um, to answer, Mr. Chair, some of your questions about the address and the parcels, over the last year, that, that sale has occurred. And so the, the parcels were then created about that time. So there's usually a lag in the, um, in the assessor's office with new parcels. So that, especially when they have to create them. So I think that's probably what you saw and that the difference in the parcels, it was just uh, more of a technical thing on the assessor's side and their records onto the GIS system. On regarding the address, the development package for this project has was just recently finally approved. Uh, I believe that the address is tied to that development package. So we were used in some, we had to use some address. So earlier on, we were using uh, the existing address of the property, but now with this new development package, there's the current address, which I think is 324 Wilmot. So that, that sort of explains those things. So I think that you brought up good points, but I think they were all just more sort of technical things that, that were happening. So, but I want to point out that, uh, and actually address one of your other questions, the parcels to the West are owned by the same folks that own parts of the mall. Um, those are parking areas there. You'll see in a minute, they're in floodplain. I think they're going to remain parking areas. And I think we have technically some access rights to those, but we, we don't know what that's going to become in the future. So really our focus has been on our project east to Wilmont. Um, the property owner that owns those two parcels that are labeled adjacent parcels here, um, they have that those parcels up for sale. They expect to develop those at some point in the future. But when they sold those parcels to CAP, they entered into some agreements where there's cross access and cross parking between all three of those parcels, the two adjacent parcels in our project. And that's important because on a storage project, you've got parking, but you don't really have a lot of parking demand. And in our, our site actually has some excess parking, but that was really designed. So the parcels that front Wilmot could, could use those parking spaces if they need to in the future, let's say a restaurant goes in there usually a heavy, heavier parking use. We wanna make sure that there's no impact on the surrounding neighborhood, especially to the South. There's a little bit of extra parking built into that. And it's important that those parcels along Wilmot can access the, the, the parking that's on our property. And that's kind of gets at the heart of, of why we're making this request, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, these parcels, uh, our parcel was actually a handyman hardware store back a couple more, probably three or four decades ago. Uh, but in around 2005, that building, that use had closed and the building was demolished. So it's been, um, it's been vacant since then. Uh, the, the other use, uh, that's the building still there used to be the silo appliance, um, TV and appliance. It's been vacant on and off used, but, uh, like I said, the owner of those parcels has those, those parcels, they're marketing those parcels. So I think there's an expectation. Those are going to be developed relatively relatively soon okay next slide please just to reiterate we did go through a rezoning in 2022 uh, we got the authorization at the end of 2022 and then we just got the ordinance for that rezoning so it uh, th that's happened since we made the application so it is now a c2 parcel um, we did that because the code has you, you've seen a couple of you know, unique code provisions related to storage and i think staff mentioned that one of those is in C1, you can only go one story for storage. Um, so that's why we asked for the rezoning to C2 to, to actually do a modern kind of storage project that's multi-story. But like I said, the development package has been approved subject to the rezoning being ordinance and we just got that, re that ordinance. So now we have a, a kind of an officially approved development package. Permits can probably be pulled within the next um, few weeks, okay. Next slide, please. So as you all know, 
for us to request a variance or for you to grant a variance, really, we need to have some sort of special characteristics or sometimes they're referred to hardships on the property. Um, there's really three that we focused on and two of them are on this slide. One is that the Alamo wash is on, really takes up the Northern 25 feet of our parcel. So obviously we can't develop in there. And then there's a FEMA floodplain that's on much of the western, uh, northwestern part of our, our parcel, it takes up about a quarter of, of the parcel. So we can't develop buildings in that floodplain. You can do some parking and access ways. And then the city has asked us to put um, kind of a, a, it's a natural area, drainage area. It's not a true retention basin. It really is more, uh, staff wanted us at that time to, get rid of some of the asphalt uh, in here because it's not needed and plant more trees and just make it more of a, a natural space with some permeable area. And so they, uh, our CLEHAP was more than happy to do that. But, um, but these are really two of our, our hardships. And then I'll talk about the, the next one in, on the next slide. So if you could, well, actually, please go to the next slide. Before I get to our project, I do wanna get into a little bit of the background. Um, Ms. Paula sort of stole a little bit of my thunder here, but uh, we did, I think, uh, assume uh, reasonably that uh, some of those special UDC provisions on storage have to do with the fact that storage before the last few years was really, uh, was, was kind of in this, this, I'm gonna call it old storage type format. Long, skinny buildings, garage door access from the front. I'm sure everybody's had, had a storage unit. Um, and you needed extra space because you could potentially have somebody parking on one side for one row and another side for the other row. You needed the ability to get through there. And, and I know the UDC doesn't tell us that, but our client tells us that, as you'll see, for their access ways, they have 30 feet width because of just that. They want the ability for somebody to park on one side and the other and have a through traffic in the middle. Um, so uh, next slide, please. The, um, the code, and this is, which, this is a snippet from the UDC, has one set of rules for all uses for access lanes and PALs. And just so you know, access lane is basically a roadway through a project a PAL is a parking access lane where you can access parking spaces off that access lane, but both of them are access lanes, just PALs you can get to parking spaces, access lanes you can't. But for all uses, there's a set of rules for access lanes and PALs. And then for storage uses only, there's a specific set of rules, which are for one way, it's gotta be 20 feet. For two ways, it's gotta be 30 feet. And again, we think a reasonable explanation of that is because you want plenty of room in a, in a storage project, an old storage project to ha allow people to access through. Next slide. But the, if, if, if you've seen around town, there's a sort of a new type of storage model that, um, that is being built. It's multi-story, uh, it's climate controlled, um, and all of the loading and unloading, all of it, occurs from the inside of the building. So these are two projects that CAP has developed. The one on the top is from South Carolina, I think, or Georgia. Uh, the one on the bottom is actually the project that we're uh, developing now at this Wilmot site. It's a rendering of that. But you'll see on the, on the sides of those buildings, there's essentially a garage door. And there's really a tunnel that goes right straight through the building. There's one garage door on one side, one garage door on the neck, the other side. Next slide. And in the middle is basically a loading area. And this is a 30 foot loading area. You see in the middle, it says drive through lane. And then on each side is a loading lane. Um, and that's in our, on our project here, we will have a 30 foot wide access loading lane. Um, and that is sufficient for all of the, the loading and unloading that goes on. All the customer activity is going to occur inside this building. So what that means is on the outside of the building, nobody's stopping to load or unload. So our building really should get the same 24-foot access as any other project in the city. What we're really asking for is just the ability to have a two-way access lanes around our building because on the outside of our building, it really does function like all of the uses. Next slide, please. 
So I, I want to just walk through briefly kind of how we evolved to this. Our original, and, and staff mentioned this in the presentation, our original submittal when we did the rezoning back in 2022 was to have one-way access lanes and PALs in a, uh, uh, in a circular motion, uh, clockwise motion around the building. And this, this would have worked because one, it would have satisfied our needs in our building, but two, we would have been able to have full cross access to those two parcels to the east. Next slide, please. The issue is that the city do the rezoning process, which they that's their opportunity to ask for things like easements or roadway dedications. Uh, there's an Alamo Greenway that's coming along that northern part of our property. And so they asked, they really required that we provide a 20 foot, 25 foot um, pedestrian and bicycle easement along that north uh, area, which CAP was happy to do. The only issue is it took out the ability to have the access lane on that north side. Next slide, please. So this is a copy of our, uh, a snippet from our development package site plan. Although I've put those one way on there to, to illustrate that uh, we could make it work from the code standpoint and with one way access lanes and PALs, but down at the, uh, on the east side of the property that doesn't allow cross access to the neighbor to the east. And that is, that is critical to the neighbor to the east. It's critical to us for our, our access. And that's the reason why we're here. I do want to correct something. We are not just asking for the 24 feet uh, where it says one way. We are also asking for the 24 feet on the east side. And on our, I'll show you on our site plan, we specifically say that, that this is, there's a, a green area that we're asking for. That's where we're asking for the relief there. But throughout most of our site, this isn't going to change anything because we already have 24 foot access ways um, throughout most of our site, we're just asking for those to become two-way traffic instead of one-way traffic. So um, next slide, please. Mr. Truman, could I interrupt and just sure. clear, ask for clarification? It, this site plan uh, we have shows the PAL or the access lane on the east boundary as 30 feet. Um, I think we put in, if, if you um, let me let me just get through a couple slides, and I think I can point out where it says that we asked for it to be 24 feet or to eliminate six feet of the the pal. Yeah. So so we used the development package site plan, and then we overlaid on there where we wanted a difference from the the developments. So all of the pals are. 24 feet. We're asking for them all to be 24 feet. I got you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this again is that table from the UDC. We're just simply saying we want to go from the 30 foot storage use requirement to the, to the, I'll call it the normal two way power requirement for the rest of the, the, the rest of the uses that, that are uh, regulated by the UDC. Next slide, please. So this is, um, this is our the site plan that we submitted. Uh, everything in there is 24 feet, and you know I will I will I will basically take responsibility for it. We we left the 30 foot marker in there, and that was a mistake. That was an error. What we did note on there is that the along the green edge of that, we want to narrow that from 30 to 24. So we probably should have not left the 30 in there. But if you see on the note, the green note on the right side, it says narrow PAL width from 30 to 24. So, so it, it, we have it in there, but th that was, I can see where that was a little confusing where we left the 30, so. So again, I think our request is pretty straightforward. We really just wanna make uh, all of the PALs 24 feet and the ones that are 24 feet make those two way. So next slide, please. So as you know, we have to uh, we have standards that we have to meet. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, in all my time of doing this type of practice, this is the easiest uh, case to justify. Uh, usually we have one special circumstance, maybe. Uh, in this case, we had three very good special circumstances or hardships. We had the floodplain, we have the wash, we have 
uh, that, that easement. So I think all three of those individually would qualify as a special hardship. Um, none of those are self-imposed, but I think that the, the nice thing about this variance is it, it doesn't grant us any special privileges. It just puts us on the same footing as all other businesses and all other, even apartments, um, in the city. And it has zero impact on anything around us, right? Uh, it, 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 we're just simply asking for the existing roads to remain 24 feet or in some case reduce to 24 feet, but just have two-way traffic on those. So it's a very minimal request. Um, and because of that, uh, we respectfully request that you approve this variance and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, haven't already been answered. Do you have any questions? I have one. I'm still like to know what's going on to the west because you uh, have all these driveways out to the west and I don't see anything on the west other than a vacant lot. You don't. Um, so what's going on to the west is there is a parking lot there. Uh, it's not on our property. It's the mall developed property or it's the property that's owned by the, the mall. Um, and so it's also in the floodplain. So are, you know, we, we think it'll probably remain parking lot for, for a while, at least, if not forever. We do have access rights to that, but we also aren't sure what's going to happen in that parking area. Uh, and frankly, access to the West is probably not going to happen very much for our customers. So really what we're focusing on is from our parcel to the east, because we've got agreements with the, those parcels to the east to have cross access and have cross circulation. I, I think this site is really gonna focus from our property to Wilmot, like most of the circulation, almost all the circulation will happen there. Um, we, don't know, we don't know what's gonna happen to the west other than it look, it's parking lot now and it'll likely remain kind of overflow parking so for the mall. So when you build the um, that roadway up on the west, what is, is it just going to put up a, a gate in front of it or a stop sign? No, there's or... I mean there's access rights over there. So we'll and it's it is paved uh, there currently. So we'll just kind of butt into the that paved parking okay. area. Thank you. But but it's not really useful for access because the bridge to the greenway is is pretty far to the west and it just it doesn't it, it it really doesn't help us from an access standpoint any other questions hearing none thank you sir appreciate it um i'll ask if there is anyone else wishing to speak uh in favor of this Seeing none, uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to this case? Seeing none. Um, and there being no further questions, I'll uh, close the public hearing then. And uh, uh, we'll open it to discussion from uh, the board. Um, I can make a motion or I can defer to Ms. Polis, who I think also uh, is ready to make a motion, but I would support Flip a motion a coin. for approval. I, uh, I see the uh, request uh, to be justified. So if uh, there is no other comments, I'll make a motion. Please do. And so I move to approve the request to uh, reduce the width for two-way parking area access lanes uh, for storage development from 30 feet to 24 feet. Um, the evidence presented to the board shows that there are special circumstances which were not self-imposed, which are applicable to the property and support the granting of the requested variance. Um, the variance uh, will not material, materially be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to other property or improvements in the neighborhood and is the minimum necessary to provide relief. I'd like to hear a second. I'll second that. 
It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. The motion carries. Thank you very much, sir. Good luck with your project. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board. Um, I'll pass along uh, this next case to my colleague, uh, Georgia Pennington. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, V10-2405, Berman Residence Garage Conversion, Berman Sally C. Living Trust, 2406 East Hawthorne Street, R1. The applicant's property is in approximately 0.3 acre lot zoned R1, a residential zoning classification, and is developed with a single family residence in one detached accessory structure. The property is located on the southeast corner of Hawthorne Street and Norton Avenue. The applicant is proposing to convert the existing detached garage to an accessory dwelling unit. The applicant's request to the board. The applicant is requesting the following variances. One, allow the conversion of a detached garage to ADU with a reduced rear perimeter yard setback from 9-4 to zero as measure, measured on the south lot line. Two, allow the conversion of a detached garage to an ADU with a height of 14 feet, which exceeds the maximum height of 12 feet of an ADU, all as shown in the submitted plans. Related plan reviews, um, the engineering section of planning and development services department has no objections or adverse comments. Planning and Development Services recommendation. PDSD staff has no objection to the applicant's requested variances. It is the opinion of staff that there are special circumstances applicable to the property, that granting of the variances will not be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious <clears throat> for other property or improvements in the neighborhood in which the property is located, and that the variance requested is the minimum needed to afford relief and the least modification possible of those UDC provisions which are in question. To date, we have received a total of two written approvals, zero written protests. For the record, board members have been provided a copy. Oh wait, no, sorry, ignore that. Mr. Chair, members of the board, this concludes staff's presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, um, I would uh, open the floor to the applicant to uh, speak in favor of this project. Hi, uh, this is Jacob Downard with Dust Architects and here with Kate Hayes. Um, we're at 212 East Broadway, downtown in Tucson. Um, did you want me to just run through a, a couple slides and give a brief summary? Sure. Okay. Um, says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Sonia, you'll need to make uh, Dust Architects a co-host of this meeting. Sonia, I believe you did it for somebody else. It should be working now. Yeah, yeah, I think you're on to it. All right, you guys can see. You guys can see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Can I go to the presentation again, Kate? Okay. All right. Um, so this uh, request is for two variances um, at 2406 East Hawthorne Street, where we are proposing an ADU conversion of an existing garage 
Um, the first variance, as mentioned, is to reduce the south setback to zero feet, zero inches. And the second variance is to raise the maximum allowable height to 14 feet. Um, so our project location here is at the intersection of Norton Avenue and Hawthorne Street, uh, right across Tucson Boulevard from um, Himmel Park um, in Sam Hughes neighborhood. Um, so a brief history on the site. Um, the residence at 2406 East Hawthorne Street was built in 1936, and the garage structure built around the same time. The property existed as this large L-shaped lot as shown in the image to the right for over 80 years. Um, so we see the primary residence, um, pool, um, the detached garage structure um, that we're proposing to convert, and the uh, heavy dash line around to be the property line. Um, and in 2017 to eight, 2018, the property was split. Um, at the south garage wall for a zero foot garage setback. Um, and the new site, walls, site wall was built. Um, this was allowable by the city because the garage is considered an uninhabitable accessory structure. And both property owners gave consent to the zero foot, zero inch setback condition. Um, so as you can see, the red line going through was the new property line. Um, this 824 North Norton property was built with a, a casita um, for a zero foot, zero inch garage setback. Um, site survey, just for reference if we need or anything, but um, existing conditions again. Um, and then proposal. Um, our intentions with the proposal are to repurpose the existing garage structure with new addition spaces to fit the needs of the owner and the conditions of the site. Repurposing what was existing as part of the ADU has been a clear priority for reasons of economy, resources, and ethics. Um, so with the proposed height of this primary garage structure that's existing, that's this um, main box I'm showing here, um, that would be a nine foot four required setback, um, which we cannot provide with its current situation. Um, so in section, um, showing context with the 2406 Hawthorne primary house, um, the existing garage structure, um, that's the 22 feet here in the middle, um, the neighboring house at 824 Norton Avenue, um, and this is what we're proposing as an addition onto the building um, to hold laundry and kitchen spaces, um, and then as well proposing to raise the, um, the height of the existing garage structure. Um, and while we understand that this exceeds the maximum allowable height um, as provided by the UDC code, um, we think this is justified for a number of reasons. And I, I'd be happy to have a discussion with all of you about this. Um, but one, architecturally, we thought this was justified to pronounce the historic element, um, to read the history and the fabric of Sam Hughes neighborhood. Um, this allows the new addition spaces to come in at the code allowable 12 foot height and still provide that um, that difference of what is historic and what is new um, and pro provide a, a much higher quality of space for our client. Um, volume of space, quality of light, airflow, um, all within a small unit um, that we think is um, worth the shot at least. Um, and then two, with the current UDC code, um, that would allow the ADU to be built up to 15 feet if it were theoretically attached to the primary house. Um, that's not what we we're proposing, but I just thought it was worth mentioning as that would adjust our um, maximum allowable height. Um, and then three, what I have um, that I want to bring into discussion too is this um, Arizona State legis Legislature that's coming through um, the pipeline that City of Tucson has been working on, from what I understand, and will be adopted by the city um, January 1st of 2025. Um, and that would allow here in the height um, section, current regulations here on the left at 12 feet, unless your primary house is two stories, then your ADU can be built up to two stories. And um, this new code amendment will allow a new ADU to be built up to the same height um, as allowable in the zone, which is 25 feet. Um, and then just understanding the street context and the um, the fabric of the neighborhood, um, some street images down here at the bottom, and then a, a section drawing um, here at the top. 
um, just to understand the, the rhythm of heights and what has been allowable to be built um, by the city and what has been approved. Um, so the main house here, um, these dimensions are from sidewalk grade just to get some human scale there. Um, so the ADU proposal we think fits reasonably well within this context and is still the most diminutive of all of the um, all the dwelling units on the street. Um, and then across the street, we do have this um, larger two-story, um, which I believe was an AD or not an ADU, but a, a habitable upstairs dwelling conversion at, at some point in the past from what I saw in the uh, city of Tucson records. Um, so I just wanted to, to see that understanding. And then uh, just a street visual visualization. Um, this is standing on Norton, um, looking towards the, the proposal. So primary house here, it's all quite screened by vegetation. So I just wanted to dash in where those, um, where those architectural changes are happening. Um, 14 feet here being the, the top dash line, 12 feet being where it is existing now. Um, and then our, our proposal would look something along these lines. Um, but that taller garage structure will be more pronounced. Uh, the new ADU addition coming in at 12 feet um, per code, current allowable height, and then um, some of this terracotta screen block, which is not related to this variance, but uh, just as shown in the image. Um, and and that's all we have. We we respectfully ask for your consideration and uh, appreciate your time. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, in the staff report that we got, um, it says that um, the garage is considered a contributing element to the National Hist Register of Historic Places and the proposed conversion will render the structure a non-contributing element. My first question is why that would be the case. Is it because you're simply altering the original structure or because of the kind of alterations that are taking place? And then it says further, the loss of the garage as a contributing element will likely not impact the status of the primary structure. I want to know why likely and not that it would not affect that contributing status of the main structure? Yeah, great questions. And I would actually refer to, to Jody Brown, um, who's the historic, um, in charge of historic review, or from what I understand at, at the city. Um, I've talked to her a little bit about this, um, and I'd like a better understanding myself. Um, from what I understand, uh, the garage will be rendered uncontributing, non-contributing um, with this change because we are adding on to it, changing the height. Um, that's all acceptable to us. And from our previous understanding, just looking at the Tucson GIS map, um, we didn't realize it was contributing um, to begin with. And that was actually just brought up recently um, from some old documentation she shared with us. Um, and then why will likely not change the status of the main house is, um, yeah, something I would like to understand as well. And um, I think it'd be important to us and our client as well to maintain that historic contributing status. Um, but I don't see why it would provide any change on that, um, to my knowledge. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, this is Mr. Uh, Mr. Dawson. Um, the uh, machinations of the historic uh, pundits and the historic people are strange sometimes. Um, so why this garage is contributing is simply because it's been there for so many years and now you're doing something different with it and so why that affects even the main structure or the actual historic value of the neighborhood is would be a mystery to me. But um, like I say, the, the historic guys are always got something going. <laughs> may, may I ask a... <clears throat> Are there any other questions? 
Yes, I just uh, would like to ask the applicant to explain the uh, reasoning behind the increased height, the building height of the uh, uh, the garage structure. Yeah, um, I, I thought I touched on this in the on the brief little presentation, but I'd be happy to to touch on it again. Um, so architecturally, we thought it was um, a worthwhile and significant move to distinguish what is old and what was historic contributing from what is being newly added. Um, and so with the new additions coming in at 12 feet, uh, the current code allowable height, um, we proposed that higher new garage height to 14 um, to be able to read that history from the street um, for the, the sake of the historic neighborhood. Um, as well as provide just a, a much higher quality of space for a relatively small ADU unit um, that gives us a, a 12 foot ceiling in that um, in that garage space for a, a somewhat grand living room with um, nice little private courtyard you can see here for just a, a high quality um, small dwelling unit. Um, and, and we just thought it was a, a reasonable um, proposal from what is existing in the street, um, as I showed on this um, street elevation um, of, of what has um, been allowable with um, neighboring two-story garage, um, upper level dwelling unit um, proposals being allowed, um, as well as this new ADU code that's um, coming down the pipeline um, on January 1st, 2025, that will allow um, any ADU to be built up to, to the allowable height in that zone, um, which would be 25 feet. So that's the primary yeah. 15. I have a question of staff, if that's OK. Um, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to want to um, give a variance for the um, height to 14 feet. But the fact that we will be required to alter the UDC to meet new state regulations, what happens if we um, deny the um, extra height and then the code changes? Would the applicant then be allowed by right to build up to the maximum allowable height that's allowed in the code? Um. <clears throat> That's an excellent question. Um, so functionally, the way that that would work, just timing wise, is that if you denied the height variance um, by the Board of Adjustment, they would still have the variance for the zero foot setback. They would it be required to modify their building plans to show the 12 foot height, which is what is permitted right now. They would get their building permit approved with the 12 foot height. They could proceed with construction. Um, but once the regulations change on January 1st, they could certainly come back and revise their building permit to whatever height that they want up to 25 feet and build to that height. So the building permit is not predicated on the variance? It, they would not be able to get a building permit at this time for 14 feet because you, if you don't grant the variance and because the code has not yet been changed. The code does not change until January 1 when the new state law goes into effect. So at this point, you either, uh, if they want to have the 14 feet, they need to have the variance. So I have a question of our attorney here. Um, Legally, we have a set of standards that we look at when approving a, a variance. Um, does anticipation of a future change to the land use code legally qualify as one of those um, conditions? That's a, that's a good question, Member Bullis, and no, it does not. Um, you, what is required is that, one, the, the variance not be self-imposed. Uh, additionally, you have to make the required findings required findings under the UDC. Those are the only required findings. I will make a clarification to my prior statement that right now they're requesting a zero foot setback, which is a reduction from the requirement of nine foot six. So I believe if they do raise the height in the future, they might have to come back for 
a modification to their variance request on the setback because the setback requirement would have also have changed. Um, I'm not sure on that because the setback is also changing with the state um, changes in January. It's being modified from uh, our current requirement for setbacks is variable based on the height of the structure. And in January, it's gonna be a flat five foot setback for ADUs. They're gonna be allowed just that five foot setback regardless of the height. Um, so I'm going to need to consult with the city attorney's office on whether that would trigger another variance or not in that scenario. I'm not quite sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're still in the middle of your presentation. So uh, is that about what? Yeah, I think we're in the middle. Uh, we, I think you jumped in in the middle and asked staff questions. We got sidetracked by that staff question. So. Okay. Uh, yes, okay. Um, then moving on, uh, is there anyone else in the audience or virtually that uh, wants just to speak in favor? Seeing and hearing none, is there anyone in the audience or in virtually that wishes to speak in opposition to this case? Yes, I, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Um, can hear you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gail Hartman, and I'm president of the Sam Hughes Neighborhood Association. And first, let me sort of apologize. Um, I've been on many Zoom meetings, but this one is a little different, and I wasn't quite sure I was you know, getting everything correct. I had quite a bit of trouble hearing the lady, the staffer, a uh, female staff person. I'm not quite sure what she was saying. Um, let me say, I'm, I'm not so much speaking against as, as I want to just give a little bit of background to this, some of which is probably not relevant from your point of view. But um, I had a very difficult time finding out information about this project. I was never able to get the architectural renderings that you have just showed. I've called and emailed many times to PDSD to try to get a hold of Mark Castro and others, and it's been just been totally unsuccessful. So I'm just kind of getting some of this information really today. I did visit the house to the south, the one that had been the new lot that had been created recently. It is rented to five college students, all very nice young ladies. They gave me the name of the owner. I called him and I never got a response from him. I've also tried to speak to the neighbor to the east and which I think is an owner occupied. Well, I don't know if it's owner occupied or not. I was never able to contact anyone there. Um, my concern generally is, and this, you know, I realize you Board of Adjustment members have very little, if any, control over this, but the ADU uh, situation, I think is getting a bit out of, out of hand. If it was designed for affordable housing, that of course is not what's being created here. And as I understand it, the owner of this house, the 2406 house, doesn't live in the house either, which means the house is being rented and clearly the ADU will be rented. Uh, as a neighborhood, we are on the National Register of Historic Places and we have to have a certain percentage of people own or occupied houses in the neighborhood to keep that status. I fear we will be losing it in the near future if this sort of thing continues. I also, my other comment, which I think I now know the answer, what, which I thought was that originally when the city passed the ADU ordinance, the um, ADUs were limited to, I think it was 700 feet or something like that. Anyway, it was relatively small. I think council member Kozacic was able to get that amendment approved. And now I see uh, the, in the newer, what the state is passing, they will be considerably larger. And even this one exceeds that, but I gather that that is and now acceptable. Um, I also thought that the proposed ADU exceeded the size of the lot, but but again, that, that seems to be changing 
so that it's much a much larger percentage of the lot that will allow to be ADU under the state standards. So th those are my comments. I don't, I think in theory, have any opposition to the two feet uh, height addition. And as Ms. Paulos pointed out, this is all gonna become moot in a few months anyway. And I don't think there's any reason to make the architect's lives more difficult by imposing a 12 foot limit and then having them just have to go back through some hoops to get a 12, 14 foot limit. But I would really appreciate it if you, the Board of Adjustments, if you are concerned about these issues at all, that you try to raise them uh, with the appropriate council members, staff persons, as to how these ADU changes are going to affect a midtown neighborhoods, any neighborhoods that are particularly the ones that are on the National Register, because the, the notion that they are achieving affordable housing, which I think was supposedly the primary goal, is clearly not being met. Uh, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Hearing none, um, is there any questions for the speaker? Okay, no, all right. Uh, then in that case, um, I will close the public hearing and uh, we will now open the floor to discussion from the board. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I really see no problem with um, moving forward the variance for um, the reduction in the setback. I think that was something that is a condition of the property when it was subdivided. Um, there was an agreement with the property owner to the south that that zero lot line was acceptable. Granted, it was a garage and not a living structure, which can make a big difference when you have a zero lot line. However, it does appear that the property to the south is not concerned about that since we haven't heard from either the property owner or the people who live there. However, I don't see anything that was presented to us that would really justify the increase in height from 12 feet to 14 feet. Um, I, I understand the quality of life and the airflow, but basically we have a set of seven parameters that we're supposed to look at. And I don't really believe that we could justify um, increasing the height at this time. And the fact is that in a few months that height can be changed anyway. So I would like to keep in within the confines of our legal responsibility. And I would like to move that we um, uh, accept um, the, or grant the variance for the reduced setback from nine feet, four inches to zero feet on the south lot line and to deny the variance for, and I don't know if that needs to be two motions or one, um, and to deny the variance request for an additional two feet in height. And I think that, um, as I said before, the subdividing of the property really did determine um, the lot line that was, um, that is being proposed here. And I feel like it's not a detriment to the area and hopefully Jody Brown is correct and this change will not impact the main structure itself. I'll second that. Mr. Hey. Chair, Member Poulos, did you want to keep the condition as it relates to the basis? It was it's moved and seconded, but yeah, Roy, I'd like to ask. My, my question was, did did you intend to include the condition previously discussed related to the parking spaces? Yes. So uh, I guess her question was, was this there was two separate motions or is this a single motion? That yes, we want to do the zero setback, but no, we don't want to do the height. And yes, we want to seek some additional parking in the front. Is this a single motion? Mr. Chair, I believe it can be a single motion. You just have to be clear as to the related findings ha only apply to the conversion of the, um, with the reduced rear perimeter setback. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's been moved. Is it a second? 
I seconded it. It's been seconded. It's been seconded. My apologies. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All right. All those. No more discussion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. I'm, I'm sorry, aye. Mr. Chair. I aye. apologize, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I, I don't believe we've actually referred to the required findings in the motion, so maybe it might be helpful to do so as it relates to that first uh, grant of the variance. Uh, yes, I think with respect to the reduced setback, there are special circumstances applicable to the property, um, whereas um, they should be able to use the zero foot setback that has already been accepted for the garage. I think that there are special circumstances due to that that were not self-imposed by the owner and the variance if granted is the minimum variance for the setback that will afford relief and allow this garage to be converted into an ADU. Thank you, Member Post. Is that all right? Okay. And it's been moved and now it's been seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, uh, I guess that's it. Good luck with your project. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the last um, item on today's agenda is uh, the other business item. I know from staff we don't uh, necessarily have anything to bring up. Is there anything the chair or vice chair or other board members uh, have to discuss? I'm sorry, what was that? The other business item, is there anything that any of the board members um, wish to discuss further before we adjourn? Uh, yeah, I just have a question about um, our current vacancies, uh, any movement towards having them filled. Um, from what I know, the ward offices have been advertising for interest in filling the vacancies, but I have not heard of any um, people that have been put forward to fill those positions as of yet. I have seen advertisements for them from the ward offices. Okay, thank you. Uh... I guess we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, I will call adjournment. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you.